Uh, it's good to have everyone with us today, and I'm really excited to talk about our core, the Center for Proteome Analysis. And we are located at IU School of Medicine in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, but we do accept samples and currently get samples from everyone throughout the CTSI program and even across the United States, we have samples coming in from. So today I wanna to talk about our capabilities uh, relating to mass spectrometry-based proteomics for analyzing protein abundances, post-translational modifications, and stability. And so I have here at the bottom our general ProtCore listserv address, and I feel free to contact us through this if anything uh, is of interest or you wanna follow up with some experimental um, planning with us. So I'd like to start with just an overview of the Center for Proteome Analysis. And hopefully you've gotten a chance to see one of us present at some point. Um, we have our fearless leader, Dr. Amber Mosley, who is the director for the center. And she's been at IU School of Medicine um, for some time. And she's a full professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the School of Medicine. And she's been in charge of the core uh, since about 2016. And I joined in 2019, right before COVID. So I am just now starting to meet people in the wild. And so I hope to see you soon, even if not in this uh, seminar. Uh, more recently, we hired Jason Aravalagan, who is in charge of some of our uh, targeted methodology and is helping out in the lab. We have a new program manager, Mandy Bittner, who hopefully you will have a chance to contact if you're uh, looking for a letter of support or getting a quote. And uh, Whitney smith Kenneman is also joining us in the, the Center for Proteome Analysis and helping out with sample preparation and data analysis. So you would uh, feel free to contact any or all of us, and that ProCore uh, email will contact all of us automatically. And just a reminder that we are really happy to provide letters of support and quotes for any of your grants. Um, but please give us about a week to get those ready. Uh, it's a little hard sometimes when it's a, a day turnaround. I'm sure you all understand. And I wanted to remind everyone here that the CTSI core pilot grants for $10,000 have both spring and fall deadlines. And uh, those are really great places to get started if you're interested in working with mass spectrometry, but maybe don't have uh, a funding yet. So wanted to remind everyone that the CTSI members receive internal rates and that we have just need a little bit of extra lead time preparing quotations um, for large clinical data sets. An overview of the instruments we have in the laboratory include four mass spectrometers and they're all high resolution orbitraps. So we have a QExactive Plus mass spec, uh, an Explorus 480 orbitrap, and then a Lumos and an Eclipse Tribrid mass spectrometer. And so these allow us to do several different uh, fragmentation modes. Uh, the Lumos has ETD capabilities uh, and the Eclipse has both HCD and CID type fragmentation available. We have a number of nano LC systems. We're mostly using uh, Easy Nanos from Thermo Fisher, but we also have an EvoCEP, which I'll be highlighting in one of our uh, clinical applications of proteomics. So in general, these mass specs can be used for a number of applications, but our laboratory focuses on bottom-up proteomics. Uh, and you can see that we have quite a throughput in the year, uh, over 270 projects and over 96 individual PIs we've worked with in fiscal year 2021. And today I wanna to just highlight some of the more common examples as well as some future workflows that we're interested in, in incorporating in the center. But this is by no means going to be a comprehensive presentation because we work with so many different types of projects uh, and we are always happy to provide a consult on experimental design, uh, sample preparation, and what sort of data analysis you might uh, need for your specific biological question. So as I mentioned in the title, a lot of what we do is looking at global protein expression analysis. And this quantitation can be done using label-free precursor quantitation, tandem mass tagging, isobaric reporter ions, um, SILAC heavy, heavy labeling, and uh, the development of targeted mass spec assays. So I'm gonna touch on a couple of these throughout the program, 
But this global protein expression analysis can take an input from uh, cells, from biofluid, from tissue, from almost any kind of sample we are prepared to lyse and homogenize and extract protein from. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about our post-translational modifi modification analysis workflows, and I'm going to highlight some phosphorylation workflow. Um, but we have worked with a number of different post-translational modifications, and we recommend some specific enrichment kits for acetylation, ubiquinylation, methylation, um, and some other acetylation variants that we have some really exciting papers in the work for uh, in the works. Uh, so hopefully the next time I give a talk, uh, I can highlight some of those. I think one of our most common service lines is uh, affinity or immunoprecipitation mass spectrometry in which you're purifying a protein of interest and maybe looking at the pro protein interaction network. And we have the capability as a sample preparation as well as protein interaction network analysis um, that we can assist with. And then at the end of my presentation, I'm also going to talk about uh, cellular thermal shift assay or thermal proteome profiling. And that looks at the stability of proteins um, and groups of proteins in your sample. So the first application I wanted to talk about today is using the EVOSEP1 HPLC for clinical high throughput proteomics. So one of the major issues with mass spec workflows can be the challenges inherent in nano liquid chromatography. Uh, overall, you, if you're running hundreds or thousands of samples, you can have a lot of challenges running at a low flow rate. And in this uh, survey that EVOSEP ran, they found that looking for reproducibility in your chromatography as well as throughput were really qualities that most survey respondents were looking for and missing in a nano LC. And so we have this EVOSEP1 capability um, that can run now up to 400 samples per day, so really high throughput with a really robust uh, chromatography. And so in some clinical applications, our, our, one of our favorite workflows using tandem mass tagged multiplexing is not always appropriate because we have a number of different individuals, they will have different genetic backgrounds, and um, it might be better to use a label-free but robust and high throughput method of analyzing. Um, we do use TMT-based workflows and we can now multiplex up to 18 samples at a time. But when you're looking at a scale of hundreds of samples to thousands of samples, uh, you need really to have a different and streamlined workflow. So the example I wanna talk about today, first uh, just showing you exactly what this reproducibility looks like just with a human cell lysate uh, run on our Explorus for 80 mass spec. This is two chromatograms from our EVOCEP uh, attached to the Explorus. And you can see that the chromatograms themselves are incredibly reproducible. And the blank that was run in between each of the samples shows minimal carryover. And that's just because of the nature of the EVOCEP um, allowing us to load onto individual tips and having really minimal carryover between samples. And in three hours of mass spec runtime, uh, we quantified almost 5,000 proteins uh, in, using this uh, data dependent acquisition method. So we applied this uh, to a recent uh, clinical sample set, and you can see that the runs are so reproducible that each rep technical replicate of individual samples groups with it itself very, very well. So this allows us to use label-free quantitation, uh, moderate to high throughput. This clinical sample set was uh, 110 samples. And we can combine this with targeted proteomics, which uh, will be further down the line in this presentation. So in this sample set, in collaboration with Zhangjun Zhang, Michelle Yip Schneider, and Max Schmidt, uh, we had 110 pancreatic cyst fluid samples. So as I just discussed before, we work with all sorts of different biofluids, sample types, and um, these are actually drawn from the cyst in a, in a pancreas in a, um, in, as a patient is in, in uh, the clinic. And so these really ranged in variability in terms of sometimes they had some blood present, uh, otherwise they were just fluid that is 
create, being created into a cyst within each pancreas. Uh, each sample was injected in duplicate, so that was 220 runs. Um, we also ran blanks, and we ran our standard human lysate uh, periodically throughout uh, the, the study just to maintain our standards and quality controls throughout the study. After we ran a data analysis, we compared the uh, nearly 2,000 proteins we identified across the 110 individual samples to the pancreas-specific proteome listed in the Human Proteome Atlas. And we found that 321 of, uh, genes are known to be elevated in the pancreas-specific proteome. Uh, and we compared our data set to this, and we found that 118 of those 321 were found in our pancreatic cyst fluid analysis. And so this isn't exactly pancre pancreas tissue, but this cyst fluid. And we, in fact, think that this allows us to kind of cluster um, this potential pancreatic secretome uh, and some really interesting things pulled out of this uh, unsupervised clustering analysis. And some, some of this is also that there are um, other uh, proteases present in the cyst fluid that could be cutting up other proteins. And um, this is a really exciting collaboration that is the data analysis is ongoing. But we're very excited for the capability of this EvoCEP where we can load samples onto these individual tips and now run up to 400 samples per day. So we're usually choosing some, something more in the middle, 30 to 100 sample per day methods. Um, but these optimized workflows are so reproducible that we can do a very large clinical uh, projects. Uh, and with running standards throughout, we know right away if there's any issue with the instrument or the LC. Um, and this is kind of our new suggestion and workflow for large clinical cohorts. If you're thinking of designing a study, um, please let us know and we can discuss, create a quote and uh, write descriptions of how we use the uh, EvoCEP with the Explorus 480 and the potential for biomarker discovery in these uh, project designs. We're also really excited that the Cancer Center here at IU School of Medicine um, supported us in purchasing an Agilent assay map Bravo, which is a liquid handling robot. And so obviously, if you're thinking of running hundreds or even thousands of samples, you wanna be reproducible throughout the entire sample preparation. So not just the LCMS, but even the uh, aliquoting and the digestion of the individual samples. So we are currently working on development of our cleanup, peptide cleanup and um, protease digestion workflows using this sample handling robot. But we're really excited because this, in combination with the EvoCEP, really opens the door to these large scale biomarker discovery and then follow up targeted validation um, studies. So I also wanna talk about our emerging application with deep proteome coverage. And we have installed a HPLC with a fraction collector and we have this deep offline fractionation of our peptides. So after we digest our proteins, we do typically do some fractionation prior to the liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And this is all reverse phase, but we have set up on this HPLC uh, high pH reverse phase, which is complementary to the low pH that we use on the LCMS that's online. And so you can get even uh, more depth of coverage. So we have uh, almost semi-preparative scale available on this instrument. So we have can fractionate between 300 micrograms to 45 milligrams of digested peptide using this system. Uh, overall, using this deep proteome coverage there is just a slightly higher per sample cost. And this is actually mostly due to the increased mass spec, spec time from running a deep proteome experiment. So to give you a couple of examples of how we're using this right now, um, in complex proteomes, uh, such as brains or brain subregions, our current the, the deep proteome fractionation workflow after Protein extraction, we digest into peptides. We tandem mass tag each of the samples so that we can multiplex uh, and combine up to 18 samples. 
And I'm not talking uh, more in depth on the tandem mass tag technology in this talk, but I'm happy to discuss or provide product literature if you have any questions on how isobaric tag reporter ion quantitation works with mass spectrometry. We then take this mixed labeled peptide uh, and we fractionate it using our HPLC and uh, we can combine and, and we run from 24 to 48 fractions where our typical workflow, we are fractionating just using a spin column and we usually run eight fractions. So, uh, then we use our LCMS uh, with our FAMES up front and uh, do tandem mass tag based quantitation and peptide sequencing. So in the, this example where we have a 16 plex of a complex proteome, so I consider brain and brain subregions a fairly complex proteome. Um, in our typical workflow, we have nine fractions, uh, which is about 27 hours on the mass spec. And we identified over 6,000 protein groups and nearly 75,000 peptide groups. And so this is a typical output of a, a quantitative experiment if you run a global protein quantitation with us. And you'll see on the x-axis, you have the log two ratio of the abundance change. And on the y, you have the log 10 of the p-value. So highlighted here are significantly changing proteins uh, between the two groups. Um, when we take a similar brain subregion, but now we do the deep proteome fractionation and run 24 fractions on the mass spec, so 72 hours total time, we're doubling our protein groups and our peptide groups. So it's really interesting because we can get more proteins identified, but also some more proteoforms. So if you're looking for specific post-translational modifications, some of this extra fractionation can be really useful. And if you're interested in finding out more uh, of how we have applied this technology, we have a number of papers now published with uh, Brady Atwood. Uh, and and if, here is one example. Uh, I think we now have three and some more in the works because we've done several of these deep fractionations with their lab. And this is just to show that this is a really reproducible, even though the high pH fractionation is happening offline. This is some data collected with Sagar Wijaratni, who is a joint student in Amber Mosley and Kim jong Su's lab. And he's done this deep fractionation. We work together to optimize. And um, in several different uh, um, ex separate, completely separate experiments, uh, we had very similar numbers of protein and peptide groups being identified. Uh, and these are all brain fractions. Uh, and I also like to bring up that sometimes this can be really useful in simple proteomes that have very high dynamic range. So these are some of the most challenging samples that we work with in mass spectrometry. Uh, for example, muscle that has uh, just uh, some very abundant, very large proteins that end up creating thousands of individual peptides. Uh, in our typical workflow, we quantify about 2,000 proteins. But in, in Tara Umberger's thesis, which is now on ScholarWorks uh, available, she graduated and she's now back doing her PhD with us. Um, you can now quantify up to 4,000 proteins by doing the deep fractionation. In a separate cyst fluid experiment, um, I was actually able to increase the coverage in the experiment from 300 proteins quantified to 700. Uh, and so, in, in some cases, this uh, little extra expense can really deepen your understanding of the system you're, you're looking at. And so one more application of looking at global proteomics is knockout verification. We've had a number of uh, individuals ask us. And so for really precise quantitation, we have MS3-based quantitation on our Orbitrap Eclipse and is now in combination with real-time search, which is a, a new uh, and only available on our Orbitrap Eclipse feature in which what, during the mass spec acquisition, an MS1 scan is taken of the precursor ions. And after MS2 fragmentation, a uh, real-time, very fast search occurs of your protein database. And if your protein or the, um, if the spectra matches a peptide in the database, then it is selected 
for MS3-based quantitation. So this MS3-based quantitation can give uh, a really precise uh, readout for your um, knockout studies, for example. And so this is one example of a confirmation of a knockout in a mouse embryo heart. Um, and you can see that we can do this quantitation while we are quantifying all the other proteins in the experiment. So this is the protein that is deleted. Um, it can be really helpful if you don't have uh, an antibody available for Western blot. Obviously that is the traditional means of verifying your knockout is to simply run a Western blot, but um, we can be really precise. We can man monitor all the other proteins changing in the same experiment and um, it give you exactly which peptides are, are missing or knocked out if you have different isoforms. So another application I wanted to discuss uh, that we have seen increased interest for over the past couple of years since I've joined is this use for targeted proteomics, which is, I think, uh, I, I see it as a, a variation of our global proteomics workflow. So we're working with a few different labs right now. We don't have any papers published yet, uh, but Jason, our assistant director, is really taking the lead on these as he has extensive experience in the, this uh, realm. And so why would, you, why would you be interested in targeted prote proteomics? Um, it can provide really sensitive quantification. It can provide a very high reproducible ability and high throughput. And it can be, uh, once developed, uh, run at a very low cost compared to antibody-based assays. Um, and it can quantify things where you don't have antibodies or you have unspecific antibodies. Um, and it is easy to do targeted proteomics with more than one protein or peptide of interest, as long as we know when we're developing the assay. So the difference between targeted versus general global proteomics is that now we're looking to just isolate specific precursor ions fragment them and quantify based on the precursor and fragment ions. And so by creating this inclusion list, um, we allow the mass spec to spend more time just looking for the proteins that we're interested in. And we have several variations of this. Uh, we have published with the Carmela, Carmela Evan Molina, Molina's lab, the quantitation of the reanidine 2 receptor, in the, and we can use this also in the background of global proteomics. Um, but we're now interested in developing assays more specifically and potentially more high throughput in a more high throughput fashion using the assay map Bravo and the EVOCEP. Some of our clinical applications, you might want to do global discovery efforts, but then follow that up with validation where you're just quantifying specific proteins of interest over time. And the general work for flow for developing uh, a targeted assay is currently we look at either data that we have already acquired on a protein of interest um, or data that is available publicly, such as peptide atlas. So we identify peptides that are proteotypic. So they need to be unique to your protein of interest. Um, they hopefully do not have very many modifications that could be variable across different samples. So you want to avoid sites of phosphorylation unless you want to quantify that specific phosphorylation. Once you identify these specific peptides, you order some synthetic standards. You can order uh, heavy labeled or just light standard peptides. And we use these standard peptides to optimize the LCMS parameters for the specific peptides of interest. Um, and we can use this free tool Skyline to very quickly analyze a lot of data. We calculate a limit of detection and limit of quantitation with and without a background matrix, allowing us to know exactly um, how much we can quantify in a specific sample type. We then look to trypsin, trypsin digestion, kinetics, and assay reproducibility uh, before we look into transferring the assay and running it in a really high throughput manner. So then the goal is to be able to submit samples and have this assay output in a, a very simple manner. So we have several projects that are in development. Uh, 
but nothing is published quite yet. So definitely reach out to us if you're interested in any more and learning more about how to develop a targeted assay. I also wanna talk obviously about post-translational modifications because it's not always protein global abundance uh, that is of interest in a specific system. In fact, sometimes it is uh, specific phosphorylation sites, acetylation sites, methylation sites. Uh, there are any number of post-translational modifications that we can enrich and look for. And in this talk, I'm just going to give a couple of examples looking at phosphoproteomics experiments measuring dose-dependent drug responses. And so this is in this post-translational modification analysis section of our uh, portfolio, if you will. So I'm gonna talk about some work done with Dominique Baldwin, who is a senior graduate student in Amber Mosley's lab. They're really interested in RNA polymerase. And this work is looking at CDK9 regulated pathways in transcription and RNA processing. So CDK9 is known to be a promising drug development target. And uh, the Mosley lab is actively looking at assays to measure the kinetics and uh, uh, throughput of CDK9 substrate phosphorylations. So in global proteomics, you won't um, identify usually more than 3% of your peptides as modified with phosphorylation. So we generally do a phospho enrichment step using titanium dioxide to enrich just phosphopeptides. Um, we then actually have, uh, after doing a phosphopeptide enrichment, we can actually uh, look at what is changing in a sample and we can order phosphopeptide standards. So similar to the targeted quantitation that I just discussed, you can order these standard phosphopeptides and you can use these standard peptides to boost the signal of phosphopeptides in your target samples. And you can, then the mass spec will reproducibly select the phosphopeptides of interest for fragmentation and quantitation. So here's an example of what MS2-based quantitation can look like, where in the MS2 spectra, you have the different multiplexed uh, TMT labels giving you quantitation at each of several conditions, whereas the rest of the spectra allows you to identify the peptide being fragmented. Um, and so in this study where we were treating with flavopyridol, the, or Dominique was treating with flavopyridol, and we were enriching phosphopeptides uh, and using a spike in of synthetic phosphopeptides, we can see that some peptides have a really clear dose response in the uh, decrease of phosphorylation as CDK9 is being inhibited. So you can see that in the control sample, um, this is a nominal abundance of a specific serine phosphorylation on HNRNP, A2B1. And as CDK9 is inhibited at different concentrations, 125 up to 1,000 micromolar, you see quantitative and reproducible differences in the phosphorylation on this specific peptide. However, in a non-CDK target peptide, we don't see the change in phosphorylation quantitation. The principal component analysis really uh, jumped out as uh, grouping these treatments with one another in the phosphopeptide analysis. And this PCA analysis is another output of either our global or any uh, post-translational modification analyses that you might do with, with our lab. Um, I think I showed an image of a FAMES earlier, but the FAMES is a field asymmetric ion mobility spectrometry, which is on the front end of our Explorus and our Eclipse mass spectrometer. Essentially, the FAMES is an electrode in which we apply a compensation voltage to. This adjusts the flight path of the uh, precursor ions in the gas phase, and it is often considered a gas phase fractionation. Um, and by changing the compensation voltages, you get different uh, selections of precursor ions detected in the mass spec. You also get cleaner MS2 uh, by decreasing the interference of other ions 
um, in the precursor selection window. And so some work I'm doing with Dominique Baldwin right now is actually to determine which phosphopeptides are detectable at each different compensation voltage and on each mass spec. So I think there's some really great analytical chemistry that we're actually working on here at the center. Um, and this is an example of some of the output where we're looking at those standard peptides that I talked about earlier. And you can see that at different compensation voltages, um, you see different numbers of peptide spectral matches. Uh, and although you might see the most at negative 55 and think that that is just the voltage you should use, you actually see completely different populations of uh, precursor ions at these different uh, negative 35, negative 45, negative 65, and negative 75. And so an example of this is that the, this peptide shown here with a double phosphorylation site, it's actually most abundant uh, in the plus two uh, form at the CV negative 45. However, at the CV negative 75, we see it's plus three form and we fragment it even better than the plus two form. And so the identification and successful localization of post-translational modification sites can be improved by the correct use of this gas phase fractionation that we have. And so continuing in the vein of understanding and utilizing information about post-translational modifications, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Peaks X Pro de novo sequencing software which is something that I started bringing in house um, in late 2019, early 2020. So they've had a, a few rounds of development and actually uh, they just reached out to me this week to beta test uh, even a new version of Peak Studio. And so the, it, we were able to have an in-house training and it was the last in-house training and seminar in uh, February of 2020, right before they shut down. Uh, and the, important aspect of PEAKS software is that it actually does this de novo peptide sequencing step. And so it looks at the mass spec data directly, and it looks for fragments that correspond to specific peptide sequences. And it does this before doing a database search. So our normal workflow involves knowing what proteins we're looking for and searching for triptic peptides using an in silico database. This uh, peak software is incredibly useful for organisms where you're not sure of the proteome. Um, immunopeptidomics is a really emerging field that we're excited to uh, make a difference on in uh, using this software or uh, any non-triptic endogenous peptides that you might be interested in. So using this software has a lot of applications. And to highlight a couple of our recent applications, I was able to actually give a talk on this paper um, from earlier. It was uh, e-published in 2021, but published this, this year. Um, and it's the most in-depth mass spec uh, characterization of a non-polymerizing form of uromodulin, um, both secreted into urine as well as into serum. And we were able to detect uh, differential processing that allows for the formation of this non-polymerizing form that hadn't been successfully characterized before. And this is an example output. Um, and this has been a great uh, collaboration and ongoing collaboration with Brad Miller and Akonovic and the uh, Turek Ashkar lab in nephrology here at IU School of Medicine. Um, I also wanna highlight some ongoing collaborations with pathology groups. Um, and this was a really exciting paper that we just published this year, uh, distinguishing post-translational modifications uh, derived from TDP43 and pathological samples. So trying to differentiate GRN type A and type B dementias um, by purifying TDP43 from brain samples from pathology. And we were able to identify a number of new phosphorylation sites and potential N-terminal acetylation. And uh, that suggests that there could be uh, processing of the protein occurring in vivo um, and modifications that might lead us to further understand how these dementias uh, progress in different patients. 
And to, so obviously there's been a number of papers published. So that paper with Laura Krakow as the first author, um, Ruben Vidal and Bernardo Getty, Bernardino Getty um, and Kathy Newell. They have been very supportive and it's been really exciting to uh, process and further understand these clinical human specimens. And we have a number of papers over the last three years as we have um, been using PEAKS. And it's ranged from discovering N-terminal methylome work. Um, this work with some people, some uh, a lab at Purdue looking at different um, uh, de novo uh, assembly of uh, actually endogenous peptides. Again, what I was talking about with not using trypsin and even crickets. I, I believe I mentioned that in the uh, intro to try to get some interest. And then a number of really exciting works with Grace, Laura, and uh, the pathology group. So we're excited to have some more publications out uh, this, this coming year. So how am I doing on time? Very good. I wanted to also discuss our use of mass spectrometry to understand protein st stability and include a, a brief introduction into thermal proteome profiling as we've had an increase in the number of groups um, asking about it. And we think it can be a really useful application uh, of mass spectrometry. And so I first wanna point out while we're on this slide that I did give a full 30 minute presentation just on thermal proteome profiling. And that is available on demand at this lab roots multiplexing for the masses TMT symposium. So please feel free to check that out. It's also got a lot of great talks by experts in the field using tandem mass tag uh, quantitation mass spectrometry. So thermal proteome profiling is a variation of a thermal shift assay. And um, it's also known in the literature as therm cellular thermal shift assay, thermal proximity coaggregation, and there's a variation also known as proteome integral stability or PISA. And essentially, uh, you're looking at the melt curve of different proteins, but now instead of using maybe a traditional fluorescence-based method, you're actually measuring abundance in the mass spec. What can we figure out uh, by measuring the melt temperature of a protein? Uh, classically, uh, I think the first work in this field was looking at protein small molecule binding, um, but now we have it's, the work has been expanded and now this thermal proteome profiling has been used for protein folding, unfolding, um, post-translational modifications can impact the stability of a protein and protein-protein uh, interactions uh, and proximity aggregation profiling can be measured using thermal proteome profiling. And to look more closely at what the data looks like in thermal proteome profiling, for each condition and control, you generate a melt curve, um, and each of these is an individual replicate run, and uh, you're looking at the control versus condition uh, abundance changes. So normalized abundance will be done at a low temperature, and you will then treat samples at increasing temperatures, and as the temperature increases, the protein aggregates and comes out of solution, and then you will see less abundance by mass spec. Um, if you see these curves shift to the right, that indicates that, that the protein is being stabilized and the thermal melt shift is being increased. If, you, um, if, you, if it shifts to the left, that could suggest that the protein of interest is being destabilized in some way. So the workflow is just as I described, the thanks to uh, Neil McCracken for that unpublished data. data. He's also a graduate student in Dr. Amber Mosley's lab. Um, and we can now work with various cells uh, as well as tissue types. So this is a really uh, interesting workflow that we think can uh, apply, to, oh, apply for a lot of uh, biological questions. And so after you uh, potentially lyse your cells, you treat them at these different temperatures, um, and then you spin them down to remove that aggregated protein. You do your digestion to get your uh, triptic peptides. After purification of the peptides, then you label with TMT. You run your LCMS, MS, 
Um, and then in your melt analysis and informatics, you can calculate the melt shifts of thousands of individual proteins, as well as the significance of those melt shifts. So there's a lot of really great work going on in the lab um, on this subject. So this is an example of some of the output where um, with Sarah Peck Justice, who is now a professor at Taylor University, um, published in 2020, where a missense mutation in a core particle of the proteosome um, shows that uh, this missense mutation only causes destabilization of the proteosome core. So PUP2 temperature sensitive is the missense mutant. And you can see that in the wild type, uh, the 20S proteosome core has a melt shift somewhat tight. And this is, uh, and in the PUP2 temperature sensitive mutant, it is destabilized. Whereas in the regulatory particle of the proteasome, none of these subunits uh, change in stability in the uh, missense mutant. So you can really get detailed biological mechanisms on protein stability and interaction by using this method. Uh, and we really think that this can be used as a screening tool for missense mutations, um, for heterozygous mutations, to try to understand the biological system being impacted by a mutation or variant. Uh, this is just a quick example of a multiomics data analysis of that PUP2 temperature sensitive mutant. And so this is multiomics in the sense that we did both transcriptomics as well as global proteomics and then thermal proteome profiling. So if you're not familiar with an upset plot, uh, it is essentially a way of viewing multiple Venn diagrams at once. And in this case, since the proteasome is being perturbed, uh, it's very understandable that a significant number of proteins are increased in abundance uh, because they're not being degraded. Uh, and then you can see some overlap in proteins and transcripts that are increasing or decreasing. However, we like to point out this uh, 15 proteins highlighted here that have increased transcripts, but actually uh, are thermally destabilized. So some of them are actually increased in abundance, but all of them, all 15 of these, are uh, the thermally destabilized results shown in the previous slide. And 14 of the 15 are those core proteasome subunits. And so obviously, uh, it's really interesting that the one additional protein that is increased as the cell is attempting to compensate for decreased proteasome activity is a DNA damage inducible protein or a ubiquitin binding uh, proteasome shuttle protein. So this is just one example of uh, some amazing data that we're really seeing with this technique. And so just to wrap up the talk, I wanna point out that we are interested in all sorts of proteomics and our future plans. Uh, hopefully uh, you have seen the CCBB here at IU School of Medicine had some omics months uh, this past, uh, the past couple of months, and we were able to have Olink Platform come and give a talk. Um, Olink Platform is not mass spectrometry-based proteomics. Instead, it is a proximity uh, extension uh, application of, of proteomics in which you have two antibodies that are specific to a protein of interest, and they have these uh, oligonucleotide pairs. And so uh, as they both bind your protein of interest, the oligonucleotides can hybridize and then be extended by a DNA polymerase. And so the thought is that by using two antibodies and then the extension, um, you can really decrease your uh, uh, false positive rate in a, an assay and you can also use this in a multiplexed manner because these oligonucleotide sequences are specific for the targets of interest. So uh, we are looking into a collaboration with the Center for Medical Genomics here. Um, I have a link to this really recent science advances article uh, showing that Olink is has a high correlation with ELISA, um, which uh, it's still a, an antibody-based technique, but it, it you would hope that there would be a correlation between the other techniques that you've been using to quantify uh, your protein of interest. And um, 
I want to take just a minute, so please scan this QR code. Uh, and it, if you have any interest at all, please fill out the form and let us know if you're interested in either learning more about this technology or once we have the technology in-house at IU School of Medicine, uh, potentially using it with us. So I'm just going to wait, wait here for just a second, um, give you a chance to scan this. And this is actually the end of my presentation. And so I would now be happy to answer any questions. And I think there are some other members of the core here too. So happy to have them chime in as needed. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Emma. That was a really great presentation. Uh, there are a couple questions in the chat. So let's start with those and then uh, we'll allow people to unmute themselves and, and ask questions. So the first question was, um, with rare and neglected pathogenic organisms, which don't have uh, annotated genomes, how well would you be able to identify proteins of interest through homology or other approaches? Yeah, and that's a really great question. Um, so we would normally choose a, a proteome of the closest available sequenced organism. However, we can use peaks as well to identify, you know, peptides that are not in any database being searched. Um, so it's still kind of a, a chicken and egg problem where you can end up with a peptide sequence that then you have to figure out what that protein might be. Um, and so I think with the combination of some proteogenomics approaches where you have long read transcriptomics um, that we can translate into a, a proteome uh, of interest. Uh, you know, I think that is a workflow that we're really interested in getting set up with the Central Center for Medical Genomics, um, but we haven't run through it entirely yet. But that's a great question. Okay, the next question is, what's the sensitivity to detect a given protein? If, if one has no reliable antibody, it is impossible to enrich the protein. And yeah, so that's going to, it is, uh, I see Jason has been replying to some of these in the chat, um, and it is going to depend on a number of things. And so uh, each peptide, each triptic peptide will ionize slightly differently, and some ionize really well and give a high abundance in the mass spec compared to others. However, if we know what protein of interest we're looking for, we can um, do some test runs and see what peptides are most abundant, uh, ionize really well consistently and have consistent retention times before we design a targeted assay. And um, you know, then you hope that one, if you have a targeted assay or really good triptych peptides, then you would be able to potentially detect without doing an enrichment step on the protein. Um, but yes, otherwise then we recommend potentially adding a tag if possible. Now that you can CRISPR in a tag, you can purify a protein that's being expressed at, under endogenous conditions. So not overexpressing your protein greatly in any system. Um, that can actually be really important in understanding specific protein-protein interactions. Next question is, do you have the capabilities to do glycoproteome analysis? That is such a good question. And um, let me please reach out to me. Uh, I've had you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm uh, very interested in glycoproteomics. And so right now, our capabilities um, generally are to remove the glycans. And we are not doing any glycan analysis by itself. Um, so Peaks is actually adding in a glycan finder feature in its next release. And I think, you know, I think it will be really interesting to do some glycopeptide analysis. And so where the glycans are still attached to the peptides, you can enrich using hillock chromatography, or you can enrich using specific lectins. Um, and then we can run using our LCMS systems that we have in place. It's really just a, a matter of differential, some different methods on the mass spec um, and different uh, analysis methods. So it's something that I'm really interested in bringing on as a, a future um, capability. Emma, I have a question. Sorry for barging in. No, it's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, so we can Emma, hear you. If, 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 we do, if we do the glycan extraction, can you do the glycan analysis? Is that even feasible at our facility? 
So is this just the sugars you're interested in or the glycoproteins? Yeah, glycoproteins? exactly. I mean, I, I mean, I both, both. So I want to do both glycoproteomics as well as glycan analysis because we want to see the differences in the side chain, basically. Sure. So what I'm asking is, we have techniques to do the glycan uh, extraction or enrichment. Mm -hmm. We can do that part and we can give you the enriched glycans as well as the, glyc I mean, total proteome or whatever glycoproteome that you need for you to do the analysis. Will that be feasible? Can we do glycan analysis at our facility? Is that even possible? So it's definitely feasible. Um, we okay. have not done it yet, though. So uh, okay. I will run a, want to run a pilot. Um, and I'm trying to write some grants around this uh, and get some money. And so if you have the opportunity to read any of my grants or... Um, uh, I can, I'll be more than happy to be part of that if you want, because we work on exclusively, we work on black protein. So, and we are interested in, I can even share with you some data where we are, we are trying to analyze the glycan side chain. And yeah, uh, because we see differential like oscillation. So Absolutely. So we want to know. So I'll be happy to be part of it if you think that's worth it. We can talk offline if you want. That sounds perfect. And and anyone else who wants to jump in on that, please feel free to email yeah. me. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Great. Uh, that's what this seminar is all about. Mm -hmm. So uh, next question is: How consistent are the results? In in a recent paper I reviewed, there was little overlap between the trials. Mm -hmm where gut pro metaproteome was detected, a number of proteins detection was dependent on the size of the database. And so that is a really great question. And I think it's related to the fact that it's a metaproteome experiment and a gut metaproteome where you, it's a mixture of different species and you're not exactly sure what you're looking for. Um, and that size of the database issue, it can be related to the false discovery rates that we apply to the peptide spectral matches in the database, as well as overlap in protein sequences, right? So if there's a lot of different sequences in your larger database that overlap with each other, then you can have a protein ambiguity problem where a peptide might be assignable to multiple proteins. Um, and so, yeah, you can have a problem with figuring out exactly what protein and wh then what species in that metaproteome study um, is really present in your sample. And I think that is, you know, a, an issue that is more unique to that mixed sample um, population. Otherwise, I think we uh, are, are quite reproducibility. You can increase some numbers by increasing the size of your database, but in general for uh, the experiments that we run where we no, it's a mouse brain. Um, we are not seeing huge differences, even if we're running with a, a larger database, uh, like for example, all reviewed and unreviewed protein sequences. Um, you might see a slight increase in your IDs, but not huge. So I, I think that's a, a pretty unique problem, but a really interesting one. <laughs> Yeah, that's all the questions in the chat. Does someone uh, have a question they'd just like to ask? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, Emma, can I ask you one more question? Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely, of course. Uh, so do we have the capabilities to do glycolipids and glycolipid analysis? I know you're talking about proteomics, but I just wanted to divulge a little bit because, you know, sometimes there are interactions between these glycolipids and the glycan side chains of the glycoprotein. Yeah, absolutely. So, and especially in perturbed systems where you're seeing exactly. changes across the board. Yeah. And we do not yeah. ha have that capability that needs to have some different columns. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that would be something, I know they sent out a survey about a future metabolomics uh, core facility. I have been yeah. sending lipid questions to Purdue, to the Bindley Center. Um, yeah, that, that's where we do it. So that's why yeah, I thought okay. we can. Uh, but I know that there is interest uh, in our department and others, the biochemistry department here and others. So I think it is something for us to stay aware of and for you to keep asking about um, as well as these surveys go out. You know, the more that you ask us about different capabilities, the more that we know what um, we should be interested in providing in the future. 
Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening. Anyone else with a question? All right, well, please feel free to reach out to us um, either via email uh, or either a pro core email or my edowd at iu.edu. And uh, we're always happy to help you write grants, um, do experimental design, and uh, we're here to help you uh, with your experiments. So don't be afraid to ask.